In the 1950s, America had broken free from the shackles of wartime economics. It was walking with the swagger of a nation that had the world by the tail. Scientists had harnessed nuclear energy. Jet-propelled airplanes were breaking speed records, and the race to space was on. But perhaps more than anything else, one thing melded imagination and consumerism, putting this era in perfect context. The concept car. Unlike satellites, rockets, and jet planes, these dream cars were accessible. People flocked to auto shows to see concept cars in their titanium-bodied glory. They were snapshots of how America perceived its future. They were simply out of sight, unforgettable. But what happened to them? Most were destroyed. Some just plain vanished. But amazingly, some are still here. Introducing the 1941 Chrysler Newport and its sister car, the LeBaron Thunderbolt Roadster. The Newport is just gorgeous. It's the last beautiful, elegant, custom-body vehicle built before World War II. Thunderbolt would be more of a sports car. It was loaded with everything you could think of back then, and things people didn't think of. And introducing the 1960 Beatnik Bandit. A car with a few incredible technical gizmos of its own. It has a tiller, which was going to be like a duo. It would accelerate, it would brake, it would turn, it would change gears. In 1941, the American economy was really getting into the swing of things. The Great Depression was over. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal had created thousands of new jobs and boosted the country's morale. It was a great time to be making cars in America. The industry was very healthy at the time. Auto sales were very good. Three and a half million cars were built and sold that year. The highest total since 1929. It was a good time for Chrysler to you know, kind of branch out and experiment a little bit by bringing out a couple of you know, idea cars. What they rolled out was a luxury town car called the Chrysler Newport and a powerful roadster known as the LeBaron Thunderbolt. Two cars that embodied elegance, style, and power. I think that the Newport and Thunderbolt represent a real change in what was going on in the United States at the time and with design. There was you know, good times to kind of come back after the very dark times of the Depression. And companies were, were experimenting. They were doing things to liven things up to make things brighter and, and more interesting. The Newport to me is one of the most elegant vehicles in the world. I think it's the prettiest vehicle when you see it moving. It's just gorgeous. Its body shape was groundbreaking. It's the first American car to have a fender line that flows along the entire length of the car. They call it functional design, where they use a wind tunnel to design the car. So it's got the long, sweeping lines. It's really bereft of any chrome or what they called gingerbread at the time. They didn't put a bunch of things on the vehicle because it's long, sleek lines. It stood for itself. I mean, it looks good without them. 
there's no exterior door handles, so you actually reach inside to open the door. So it's just a long, beautiful, sweeping vehicle. Today it looks like an artifact from another time. In 41, it looks like it was from another world. The tiny home, but you still had a very much upright windshield, very large grills, you know, very high stance vehicles. Vehicles had large trunks and just kind of chopped off at the end. This, they lowered as much as they could, again, using wind tunnel testing to cut the air as best possible. Tapered the back end to let the wind flow over the vehicle, so it was much smoother. It was a thoroughly modern creation that also breathed new life into an old concept. It revived the 1930s approach of having the passengers sit in a separate compartment. They call it dual cowl setup, where there's actually a second cowl like in front of the driver uh, with a windscreen to keep the wind off the passengers. And actually it did have um, rear view mirrors on each side so the passengers could see what was behind them also. It was based off the Imperial chassis and those were big cars. It's uh, I think 142 inch wheelbase. Then it's got a large engine, 232 cubic inches, 140 horsepower. So that's pretty large for the time. So it gets up and moves and, and drives along pretty well. It wasn't the most practical where it didn't have side windows. It did have a convertible top, but you know, people were by then used to roll up windows, which they didn't have in the 20s, but by the 30s you get used to being able to close the weather outside. Now, you couldn't do that in this vehicle. For customers focused on technical innovation, Chrysler built a sister car, the Thunderbolt. It's a two-door, two-seat roadster that's jam-packed with gadgets. It was loaded with everything you could think of back then and things people didn't think of. The power windows, brand new to everything. The radio had been around for a while, but it was very rare to have a radio in a vehicle. And then, you know, power wipers. That was just an amazing advancement for everything. It was all the modern gadgets you could possibly put on a vehicle. We like saying 10 years ago, thinking that you could have a DVD player in your car, you know, you, that would be incredible to have a TV in your car, but now it's standard. So that was very huge innovation back in the day. It had a futuristic style as well. The interior with the solid seat with lack of pleats in it, because they pleated everything back then. So it has that definitely modern touch to it. It was a jet age car before there were jets. They called it the push button car because you can push a button and open the door. The gauge cluster, the way it's set up, is, is very modern, yet it's very functional at the time. The most original feature was the fully retractable hardtop. The a huge innovation to be able to push a button and then your top just go away and fold away. Other automobile manufacturers followed 10 to 15 years later. Other features reached the market much sooner. It had hidden headlights, which would become a feature on the 1942 DeSoto model. So something that was concept went straight to production on that vehicle. Chrysler built six of each model. They were painted in a wild array of colors from sunshine yellow to burnt orange, sea foam green to midnight black. The dozen cars were spread around the country to excite potential customers. People actually travel from city to city to try and see the different cars in the different colors. Um, so, you know, you've seen one Thunderbolt, but you haven't seen them all. So you go to the next city to see them. So, uh, they're a huge hit. But their allure soon faded in the dark shadow of world events. It was uh, bad decorum to be shipping a beautiful, expensive vehicle around. America finally emerged from the Great Depression and started to flex its industrial muscle. Riding that wave of optimism, Chrysler debuted two incredible concept cars, the Newport and the Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt is meant to give the appearance of moving fast. 
the Newport more of a touring vehicle, something that you would take out and enjoy the road. They built six of each and toured them around the country. One of them paced the Indianapolis 500 in 1941, and that was the first non-production vehicle to pace the Indy 500. After the race, it became the daily driver for Walter Chrysler Jr. Another of the Newports was owned by movie star Lana Turner and spent a decade turning heads on the streets of Hollywood. Despite their popularity, neither model ever made it into production. In December of that year, America went to war in both the Pacific and in Europe. That put an end to the era of elegant automobiles. World War II really interrupted everything. And they actually put the Newport and Thunderbolt in mothballs really for a few years. Uh, auto companies weren't out there showing what they could do. Everything was geared towards war production. All passenger car productions ended in February of 1942. The number of new cars sold fell to just over 20,000 that year, and only 139 in 1943. By the time the war ended and the auto industry got back to the business of building cars, the Thunderbolts and Newports were yesterday's news. They had done everything they could with them. They showed them a little bit after the war, but they were trying to put out new things. In 1950, all 12 cars were sold off to private owners at the then astronomical price of $8,000 apiece. It has been more than 70 years since they made their debut, but this pair of concepts are still capable of inspiring. It's a moment in time where anything was possible, that you know, you can dream it, you can build it, and nothing was out of the realm of doing. You know, you could actually build these vehicles, put them out there, drive them, and the public could see good times on the horizon. Chrysler's 1941 Idea Cars promised America there were better times ahead. Two decades later, the beatnik bandit arrived at a very different turning point in American cultural history. The beatnik bandit looked like a cartoon car. That's not surprising, because its creator is Ed Big Daddy Roth, the airbrush artist that drew Rat Fink. For teenagers at the time, Rat Fink was the anti-Mickey Mouse. He represented anything their parents didn't approve of. That made the bug-eyed rodent wildly popular. If you have enough gray hair these days, you had something to do with the rat fink in your youth. Ed Roth's car was built with the same rebellious spirit. It's probably as far from a four-door family sedan as, as one can get and still stay on wheels. It's not really a sports car, it's definitely a hot rod. It's very lightweight, very powerful, power to weight ratio off the charts for the, the technology of the day, but also very unforgiving. The chassis is a shortened Oldsmobile, shortened down to 85 inches, and then he's dropped a full 300 cubic inch blown Olds engine uh, back inside our early 50s, we believe it to be 1949. Uh, supercharged dual carbs, uh, B&M hydro transmission, uh, all the latest speed equipment as of 1957-58 when he was putting this automobile together. That makes it sound like a street racer's dream, but driving it would be very dangerous, even foolish. It has a tiller which was going to be like a do-all. It would accelerate, it would brake, 
it would turn, it would change gears. Everything was going to be handled by this one control lever in the automobile. The apparatus that makes the car steer is basically a hydraulic pump that's mounted independently uh, in the framework of the car and there are two electrical switches on either side of the, of the tiller so that you just bump the switch and turn the motor one direction or the other to force the hydraulic ram to expand or contract. And if you can imagine, that gives you absolutely no steering feel, so you're constantly, you would bump one direction and then you would have to bump the other direction to come back to straight. If you overcorrected, um, you can see what's going to happen at any kind of a speed. We do have notes that uh, Ed drove the car across the parking lot at least once, but uh, I see that he uh, found it quite unacceptable and recommended nobody ever do it. If you were going to take it for a spin, you'd also have to be a fairly tiny person. There's a photograph of a couple of showgirls taken at one of the car shows, you know, and they're kind of crammed into the machine. Uh, eh, not, that didn't look very comfortable. He couldn't drive it around town, but that didn't stop Ed from showing it off and using it to promote his real business selling t-shirts with his cartoons on them. Most of Ed's cars were meant to be brought into the Autorama. Everybody would ooh and on. He would park and uh, set it all up with all these little goodies. And then he would be nearby doing the t-shirt business, raking it in that way. Every hour or so, Ed would come over and they'd do a big trumpet fanfare thing and Ed would demonstrate the car. On our particular beatnik, there's a little remote control box tucked back into the frame, and he could roll that out, and he had all the buttons and switches there. He could raise and lower the top, he could turn the wheels, he could start the engine, then he could reach over and jazz the throttles, and, and everybody would make a lot of noise and stuff like that in the building, and everybody would applaud, and he'd shut it back down and tuck the box away and go back to selling t-shirts. As a marketing tool, it was spectacular. As a real prototype, it never had a chance. By the time you scale the automobile up to where it's actually usable, comfortable to drive, uh, where an average individual can sit in it, it really blows it all out of proportion. Uh, the bubble top would have to be so tall, I, I think it would lose all the attractive uh, characteristics of the lines it currently has. Plus, the paint job is ridiculously expensive to do and that sort of thing. By the time you tone down a car as you would for mass marketing, I don't think it would have the appeal that it currently has. And most of that appeal, I think, is in it being one of a kind. After its life as a show car, the Bandit entered mass production in a very small way. At one point, they were paying like a, a penny a box for every model they sold. In the 1960s, young people all across America were rebelling against the mainstream. It was also the height of the hot rod culture in Southern California. The Beatnik Bandit appealed to both the hippies and the gearheads. Ed Roth is coming out of the beat generation, going into the 60s generation, the summer of love and such as. He's kind of out there, you know, in the pits with these big gas machines. Whether they were real or imagined, he fleshed out his imaginary creations by building these rods. For a car that couldn't be driven, it ended up making a lot of money for its creator. caught the eye of the Rebel model people. At one point they were paying like a, a penny a box for every model they sold. And supposedly one year he made over $30,000 at a penny a box. So you can imagine how many models they were selling of Ed Roth cars. A few years later the toy maker Mattel came calling, wanting to make it even smaller. In 1968, they released a new line of toy cars called Hot Wheels. They made 16 different cars that first year, 
one of which was a replica of the Beatnik Bandit. Through its life as a show car, a model and a child's toy, the Bandit became etched in the minds of a generation. The Bandit and all of Ed Ross' work, Big Daddy Ross' work, has a huge following in the hot rod community. Very select in a, a group of individuals, but um, they're again hearkening back to the, the youth of that group of well, those of us who are 50 and 60 years old that remember those days as, as kids, you know, growing up and wanting our first automobile. These things were extremely cool. The original prototype now holds a prominent spot at the National Automobile Museum in Reno, Nevada. It's displayed in the front lobby, surrounded by other Ed Roth creations. They have a nice little corner where we can display uh, our body of, of Mr. Roth's work. Uh, Mr. Roth was kind enough to donate um, Beatnik 2 later on in the 90s. Beatnik 2 is a 1990s revision of the original 1960s concept. The bubble top still remains, but he had given up on the tiller steering. They touch a part of everybody who's a gearhead in the 1960s. Kids growing up to be gearheads, current gearheads at the time, anybody who was interested in the automobile hobby, particularly hot rods and the show rods, uh, the autorama cars, such as in the 1960s, the, the Oakland Roadster show, the Detroit autorama, such as, you know, if you were, you know, if you're having your dad drag you to one of those shows, you probably had a Rat Think model or something like that stashed in your room somewhere. And so that goes back to that generation of individuals when you display a car like that. We're building on memories when we bring an, an old automobile out for somebody and it's to touch that part of your soul that that automobile connects with. And for many people now, my age, thereabouts, these automobiles touch that PC review. The Beatnik Bandit is a 1960s hot rod created for young rebels. The Newport and Thunderbolt are optimistic creations from when their parents were young. Together, they provide a picture of how two very different generations viewed their present and their future. <laughs> 